Welcome to the Mindset Game Podcast. I am very delighted and grateful to have a very special guest with us, Dr. Roland McCready. Dr. McCready is the Executive Vice President and Director of Research of the HeartMath Institute. He is a psychophysiologist with research interests in the physiology of emotion and how emotions influence cognitive processes, behavior, and health. And for those of you who are not yet familiar with the HeartMath Institute, it is a nonprofit research and education organization providing simple user-friendly mental and emotional self-regulation tools and techniques that help people release stress and break through to even greater levels of personal balance, stability, creativity, intuitive insight, and fulfillment. Dr. McCready is also the Director of Research and Project Coordinator of the Global Coherence Monitoring System which is a global network of sensitive magnetic field detectors that monitor fluctuations in the Earth's geomagnetic fields and resonances in the ionosphere. Welcome, Dr. McCready. It is such a joy to have you here with us. Well, it's my, my pleasure to be here. Thank you. So uh, if it's all right, I would like to start off, since this is a podcast about mindset, about how our inner state of thoughts and emotions impact our external reality, um, I would like to uh, perhaps start with your perspective on how um, those patterns, if you will, uh, our habitual patterns impact our reality. What do you see as, as that in your research? A oh, great question. Um, you know, I might, um, certainly mindsets is relevant, but I think we need to add emotional sets maybe to, to this discussion and equation. Because it's really our emotions that run the show. Uh, we tend not to want to believe that sometimes or uh, think that, but, it, but it's the, certainly the way physiology works. And of course, our beliefs and you know worldviews and all this are really important and, and have a lot to do with this but a lot of that's actually based on emotion as well and where i think uh, i'm going to intuit a little bit into your question that you're asking me to go is uh, a lot of our work on based what we call baselines and baselines um to, well let me back up a little bit so um, I get to give credit here to one of my mentors. I've, had, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of uh, older, uh, very wise mentors in my life. Uh, one of which, if it relative to this conversation, is a guy named Carl Prebrum, Dr. Carl Prebrum, uh, who's considered by many to be the father of modern cognitive neuroscience. Um, I won't go into his resume, but it's pretty impressive. Anyway, he, he um, got drawn to our work uh, many years ago, and, and he unfortunately passed away probably about five years ago now. And he was head of brain research at uh, Stanford for until he retired. And then he went and opened another brain lab. And you know, was, uh, anyway, his passion was understanding emotion. And uh, and uh, just to give uh, some understanding here, uh, Dr. Prebrum was literally one of the very first neurosurgeons in the world. Uh, so he kind of came into it when we knew nothing about the brain and was what a pioneer in really unraveling how the brain actually works. Uh, so he's a guy who coined terms like executive functions to describe the front, the, the frontal part of the brain. And so many of what we take for granted now all came from, from him and his work. Uh, but as I mentioned, his passion was really trying to understand how, what emotions are and how we produce those. And that kind of became his, his thing. And what he actually found and showed was that the, if we need to think of the brain functionally, as basically what it does is that it recognizes patterns. It's a pattern processing system. It stores, analyzes, and recognizes patterns. And that, that's more or less true at every level we want to look at, whether we're talking about controlling our blood pressure, hormonal rhythms, um, emotions, even our thoughts and cognition, all based on pattern uh, analysis. So in terms of uh, emotional experience, which I think we should start with because so much of what we tend to think, you know, that we think is rational is really underneath that is an emotion that the brain is already just basically trying to justify what we already felt and what we're thinking and, and all this. Um, and, and emotions happen faster than thought. Um, it's all kind of well-established concepts now, or not concepts, uh, uh, 
facts. So the one of the parts of the brain we need to talk about in this context is the amygdala, or amygdala, there's, there's two of them. And uh, there's a lot of uh, kind of nonsense, if you will, about the amygdala, especially in the media and popular media that, that's come out over the years, like it's the fear center and it's, you know, these kinds of things. That's absolutely not true. I mean, yes, it's involved in fear, but it's not the fear center. I mean, it's not just what it does. What the amygdalas are really doing is determining what is familiar and not familiar. Okay, and that's based on pattern recognition. Now, for it to do that, it has to have something to reference to the past in this case. So the to use Dr. Prebrum's language, he basically said the, the amygdalas, and this is all neural activity in, in the neural architecture in our brain that's, that's going on, that where um, we basically become what he would call familiar patterns. That's the historical part, right? Something that we often repeat, you know, becomes familiar, becomes our baseline. And then what the brain is basically doing is comparing the now to the reference, the baseline reference, and saying, is there a match or a mismatch? Now, the brain likes a match. That's what we want, and that's what we experience as comfortable, right? And if you people, I think if you think about this, it makes a lot of sense. But it's really interesting. I just read a, a study, I don't know, maybe a, a month ago now, that actually found that we, we tend to marry people that look like our siblings or somebody in our family. And I went, aha, it's the, it's the familiar yet again at work here. Um, it, it shows up in so many ways. So the amygdala is doing this, this basic process for what we sense from the external world, you know, what we hear, what we see, smell, right? The, the external sensory systems. Then another part of the amygdala is doing the same thing for the body's internal sensory systems. It's called interception for the, the science-minded here. So there are many sensory systems in the body that are sensing all kinds of things, you know, biochemistry, uh, especially the heart. In fact, the heart is a, really a sensory organ. There are many um, sensory systems in the heart that are sensing biochemistry, rhythm, pressure, rate, all kinds of things. And then that's processed by what's called the intrinsic cardiac nervous system, or the brain and the heart, and then sent up to the brain. In fact, the heart sends more neural signals to the brain than the brain sends to the heart. And there are direct neural pathways from these technically called afferent or ascending neural pathways come up from the heart and cardiovascular system and right up, literally right to the amygdala, like right, one synapse away. And so the, the cells at the core nucleus, it's called, or the center of the amygdala, are synchronized to the heartbeat. So every time the heart beats, the cells in the amygdala fire in unison with it. So the, back to one of Dr. Prebrum's 1969 papers, he said the heart is the primary source. Well, first of all, it's the major source of rhythmic activity in the human body. Right? The, the heart is the big rhythm maker. And so the inputs are going directly to the amygdala. So it's the main input into it that establishes the familiar patterns, the baselines. That it's, because it's regular, it's always going on. So some of our work, I'm gonna, I know this is a little convoluted, but hopefully I'll weave a story here that eventually makes sense. It's perfect. Yeah. If uh, we are in a situation where we might get impatient a lot, right, or frustrated, well, that has a very specific heart rhythm that's associated with it. That's some of what our work found, is that the rhythm of the heart is the best indicator of emotions, what we're actually feeling, whether we are cognitively aware of it or not. So those inputs are going directly to the amygdala. Now, I, I have a personal kind of example of this. In my childhood, one of my grandmothers, um, she actually drove us crazy as kids because uh, worried. she was worried about everything. In, in her world, if she wasn't worried about us, you know, grandkids, she wasn't caring about us, right? I mean, that, so it, you know, so anyway, uh, I now understand that what it, that worry and that kind of worry slash anxiety was her baseline. That had be some, that was familiar to her. So for her, that, those feelings and emotions is what created the match and made her, as crazy as it sounds, feel comfortable. And you probably, if you think about it, uh, 
Loretta, you probably know people that, that I'm describing, right? It may not be worry, but it's, you know, that's, so we can say these become our traits or, you know, or our, our attitudes based on these baselines. Hope I'm making sense here. Oh my goodness, you are. And it just brings up so much compassion and yes, exactly. forgiveness, right, of ourselves and others. Because if someone has a default state of being really angry or impatient or worried, uh, then they're not actually like choosing it. It's they're not at choice in that moment. It's right. just what's most comfortable and familiar to the body. It's almost like a survival <laughs> mechanism. Yeah, yeah, because the brain wants comfort. It wants to create a match. Uh, so even if there's nothing to worry about, we'll find something to worry about because that's. I mean, it's, but it literally works this way. Uh, so you're absolutely right. Once I really understood this, it really evoked a lot more compassion and understanding for where people are, are really at. And I'm kind of picking on worry and anxiety because of the grandmother here, but everything we perceive goes through this process. Right, both from the external world and the internal systems, this pattern matching process. Now, that same grandmother, by the way, was a great baker. <laughs> and she loved to, to make sure we always had fresh, warm chocolate chip cookies, right, whenever we came to visit. So, so the amygdala is not just familiar, unfamiliar for negative things or like fear. So, to this day, you know, I smell a chocolate chip cookie or see one, it evokes. You know, that positive feeling in me, right? Not that I'm necessarily remembering all of the sequences, but it's, it's a positive association. So you get where I'm kind of going with this. It's really familiar, not familiar, and our experience with that, right? I hope I'm making sense. You are, you are. And it just brings, again, just such a, a level of understanding for why people are the way they are. And oftentimes we're not conscious as to the root of those you know, patterns, those baselines, because they happen well before, you know, we can remember usually as a young kid, sometimes even in the womb. And so um, one of the things that I know for sure, through my work with, with heart math as a trainer, and of course, uh, other things that I do, is that no matter how long we've had these baselines, these, mm -hmm. you know, patterns that are no longer serving us, uh, maladaptive, if you will, these maladaptive baselines, um, we can absolutely change them. We can transmute that default state, if you will. And so what do you see in your work around that? If somebody's okay. saying, I've been this way for 30, 40 years, I don't think I'll ever change. Yeah, I'm proud of it, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, it's really true, right? I mean, we get so ingrained, you know. It's our identity. Right, with that, that identity. Um, you know, like, I mean, I've seen people like, had, you know, taking my family, you know, uncle so-and-so, he's the hard-headed one, you know. Uh, you know, we kind of come up with this, or they're the this type, you know, and they're kind of, yeah, that's me, you know. Uh, <laughs> anyway. It's true. Uh, it's it's, it's true. really true. All right, well, that was, it's a great question. And I'm going to go back to Dr. Prebram's work, because he actually proved this. And, it, and it's kind of an, almost embarrassing to say he, he hung out here a lot. He, he would visit every year and spend a week or two here. And, and I got to know him pretty well. And it took a number of trips for me to, for it to really dawn on me what he was trying to tell me all this time, uh, especially given the nature of our own research. But what he actually proved in his, his neuroscience work was that the only way you can establish one of these inner reference patterns, these unconscious reference patterns, or change one, is you have to change the input coming into it from the body and especially the heart, because it's the main rhythm maker. You cannot think yourself into a new baseline. And this, boy, what a light bulb once you really understand this, and it explains so much of what's going on in current research. Although a lot of people don't really understand yet the mechanisms Right. Um, so there's kind of a big shift out of everything being cognitive, this cognitive, that behavioral therapy, this, that. Not that those aren't helpful strategies in some cases, but that doesn't shift baseline. So we tend to fall right back into the old patterns. Right. Or, you know, how many people set, you know, New Year's resolutions were kind of in, still in that zone. And, you know, you can about count the days or weeks until we're right back into the old pattern because we haven't shifted the, the underlying fundamental baseline. Anyway, so you have to change the, the, the activity of the heart on, on enough times that it establishes the new pattern. So that takes us right into these simple heart math techniques um, 
that you know seems so simple and people tend to go oh well i do that well yeah do you really um how, how genuine are you using them and meaningful and are you really sustaining it long enough to shift the the reference pattern because it's the repeated patterns right that establish the familiar so when we use these simple techniques like heart focused breathing freeze frame i know you're a trainer so you know the techniques we are literally shifting the rhythmic activity of the of the heart which is sending a very different signal to really all centers in the brain but directly into the amygdalas so we practice those skills enough times you know over say a few weeks that's how we establish a new baseline reference and that's when the work becomes transformational right and not just heart math it's there are really a lot of uh approaches in these days that are called somatic uh, kind of approaches where you're changing the body and that's but a lot of them don't really understand the, the mechanisms yet but that's really what we're doing we're changing the inputs especially the heart to the brain and do that often enough long enough we shift that in a reference pattern um, does that make i hope i'm saying this in a way that's clear enough for our listeners i'm trying to not use neuroscience language here <laughs> thank you i believe you are and we've had other episodes where we've talked about coherence and incoherence. So those listeners that wish to go back to some of those episodes and have an even more basic understanding of what that means, of course, they're welcome to go back to that. And, and it's really exciting to have you here with us because you have uh, such a wide understanding, not only of kind of the physical heart, but also the energetic heart and, and how our interconnectivity, if you will, uh, with the the field around us, right? The the fact that our heart is this conduit, if you will, the primary conduit. Um, what I've heard you refer to as kind of the the radio signal, if you will, uh, between us and what some might call a higher self or spirit soul. Um, and so, I'm curious about that, the energetic heart, for a moment, because we've been talking about kind of our own physiology and those shifts that help us to create those cognitive shifts, right? So when we change how we feel, we change how we think, and we can create new solutions. But would you be willing to kind of extend that into kind of this, the field, if you will, this electromagnetic field, and, and what difference does that make? Okay. Um, yeah, there's really two levels that you, you brought into your question there. Um, so we let's start with uh, the physiological level. The whenever the, the heart beats, it creates electricity. That's why we call it the electrocardiogram, right? When you put electrodes on to measure the heartbeat, or we stick electrodes on a person's head to measure the EEG, which is all, what we're measuring there is current flow, quite literally. I mean, you're having a little amplifier and you're measuring the current flow across the electrodes. Um, so in, in this case, the heart's the big player again, right? I mean the electrical amplitude or the voltages that the heart generates compared to, let's say, the brain are many orders of magnitude greater. Um, I mean, measured in millivolts versus microvolts, for, for example. Um, but whenever we have a flow of current, you know, which is done probably many hundreds of thousands of times every day in doctors' offices around the world, and right. Uh, well, they're really measuring energetics, although we didn't. That, so, it kind of introduced in a new way of thinking of this, because uh, whenever there's a current flow, that doesn't I mean this is physics 101, right? You create a magnetic field, right? Anytime there's a flow of electrical current, you generate a magnetic field. And my previous career, by the way, before I became a psychophysiologist, I don't know, 35 years ago, whatever it is now, I was a communications engineer for Motorola. Uh, that was my original career, and, and uh, <laughs> Something I know a little bit about is how we use electromagnetic fields to carry information. Right? Cool. The way our cell phones work, or radios and TVs, all use this basic principle. But it's the uh, I like cell phone analogies these days because everybody's got one. So it's the magnetic component that goes through things. Um, it's why our cell phones work indoors. Right? You can even be in an elevator, right, and talk, have a conversation on your cell phone. So those walls aren't barriers to the, the, mainly the magnetic field. Electric fields are easier to shield. But, uh, so the same thing's true of when the, the current flows produced by the beating heart or the activity in our brain, they create magnetic fields that easily go through the skin and radiate out into the space around us. Now, I'm not talking about what a lot of people might be thinking of an aura here. Um, because I, and the reason I say that, this is something I can measure. How do I know this? Well put a probe out here called a magnetometer and you can measure it 
right? And you can measure the magnetic field of the heart a number of feet away from the body. You can measure a brain wave, external, without touching the head, about an inch away, right? Heart, feet, right? So you can see it's energetically speaking, uh, kind of the main yeah. radiator. So are you saying, Dr. McCready, for those people that this is brand new for, that you can actually measure how someone might be feeling, you know, by kind of measuring what's around their body without actually yeah. even touching yeah. their body? Right. Uh, you're measuring the magnetic fields. Now, um, it's really funny to me. Every now and then, if somebody will come up and say, there's no such thing as a field around the body. And I'm like, well, okay. Um, every major hospital has devices called MCGs, which stands for magnetocardiogram. So right now, as we're speaking around the world, people are measuring the magnetic field of the heart without touching the body. Right now, somewhere, uh, probably multiple mm -hmm. times, is, you know, it's kind of, uh, I mean, this has been known since, I, I have a, one of the books on the shelf behind me, a book on, on bioelectromagnetism, actually has a graph of the heart's field measured magnetic in the magnetic domain and actually has it accurate the right shape that was published in 1886. So this is not, people just haven't learned this, right? So what um, the, there's no question we're radiating a magnetic field. I mean, it, it, that's just silly to think otherwise. What we were able to do though, is we, we using my old, old days communication engineering approach, uh, actually to, to almost a, a did, almost the identical techniques that we would use to demodulate or look at what, what is the information being carried by the field, we, we just applied that to the field being produced by the heart. And it was actually really easy. I was shocked when nobody, to find nobody had ever done it before. And what we were able to show was that the, that information being carried by the field, just like a cell phone would carry our voice or the text message, the heart's field is carrying it, uh, probably a lot more than this, but for sure, information as you already alluded to about our emotional state. Right? In fact, we can measure the, decode that information being carried by the field and tell with it these days about 75, 70, 75% 75 accuracy what somebody's emotion is. Right? So in other words, what we feel inside isn't just stop at the skin. We are literally broadcasting that. And I, for most people, they're probably not going like, oh, wow, you know, like this is some <laughs> new discovery. But yeah, it is scientifically. But we all, most people already know this. It's in our language, all the sayings we have. You know, the tension was so thick in that room, you could cut it with a knife. And, you know, or we walk into an environment, and we feel it, right? Um, you know what I'm talking about, I'm sure. But, Absolutely. Uh, we've, we've all been there. We've you all know, been you go there. into a room, you see a friend, and, you know, without even knowing what's happened, you know, you can kind of sense that something is going on yeah, just or, energetically. Or, yeah, absolutely. And sometimes it feels really good, right? We yeah. have a coherent field. So we yeah. were able to, we were, so step two is we were able to map. In fact, there's almost a direct mathematical relationship between the, the what's called heart, heart rhythms, the variability and the beat-to-beat -beat changes in the heart, which we, that was our first work showing that that is most reflective of emotions. Well, that's mirrored in the information patterns in the magnetic field. So um, that's probably a little bit too complicated, but, but <laughs> anyway. Um, so the next step in our, our work was then to say, okay, well, this is pretty cool. Um, so what, but is there a so what to this? Are our nervous systems also receivers of this biologically generated field? And as it turns out, that was a pretty easy question to answer, yes. In fact, the, the, um, there's always a lot of informa you know, talk and concern these days about you know, fields and that we live in. And another one of my uh, actually older mentors, a um, guy named Ross Aidy, pretty famous guy in, in the bioelectromagnetism world, actually um, long before I came along showed that our physiology is sensitive to external magnetic fields, electric and magnetic fields, but only in very narrow windows and ranges, amplitude ranges and windows of frequency. Uh, otherwise, it rejects pretty much all this stuff. So it turns out the windows that he identified are the same rhythms and frequencies that we biologically generate fields in. Wow. You get where I'm, what I'm saying there? So the fields that we're producing biologically are the same ones that we're ex exquisitely sensitive to. We were able to show that not, we're, we're radiating the fields, but our physiology of others is receiving them 
and has measurable physiological changes. In other words, what we're radiating is being detected by and affecting in measurable way others around us. So um, if you're, a, a, say, a, an executive in a company or a leader or just in a family, it doesn't really matter. Becoming more aware of this is really important because the one of the biggest energy drains and costly things in uh, in, in a business context is communication errors. Mm -hmm. well, well, I should say that another way. We one of the biggest reasons for mistakes and costly things is miscommunication. I think every leader would agree with you. Yeah. So let's take it. Um, you know, and that I mean, the message could be delivered perfectly, but we don't perceive it as delivered or we're not actually communicating as clearly as we think we are. But here's the thing, and if you think about this, I've watched this happen so many times now, since really doing this work, uh, which dates back into the 90s now. You can watch somebody having a conversation, two people having a conversation, you're kind of off the side, just kind of, you know. <laughs> and a person says something, you know, you hear the words, and you can almost sometimes feel that there's something else underneath it that's not said and that what the other person hears and walks away with is not what the person actually said. It was that unspoken energetic communication that goes on. Yeah, Dr. Mercury, you know, one of the things, if I may intervene for a moment, oh, uh, a couple of days ago, I was doing a change management training for a group of CEOs and one of them said to me, well, you know, because we were talking about how important it is to communicate and kind of get a sense of where people are at with regards to the change, kind of assess what potential pockets of resistance might be. And he said, well, I ask people, but they don't actually tell me. Like, I can sense that there's something going on, but they won't tell me. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, we don't have time to go into the slices and dices of how important what I just mm -hmm. said is. I mean, if you're really, especially if you're a leader, you know, trying to create change or shift, you know, the baselines we talked about in terms of our own brain, well, those actually are occurring in, in the social dynamic as well. There's also shared baselines that we develop. Um, okay, this is getting, I'm probably taking this into another direction here, but, uh, you know, because our brains are wired for connection with others, right? Um, and so we develop kind of organizational baselines, if you will, or family baselines as well. And if, you, if you're want, wanting to make change within an organization, or it could even be our family, right, within groups, we also have to become aware of how these organizational baselines are, are, are very alive and well. Uh, so just saying something that we're going to change so-and-so, well, you're not bringing the brains along with that. So you get a lot of resistance. In fact, one of the reasons that we hate change so much, especially unexpe unexpected change or change that we didn't initiate, is because of this familiar or not familiar place in our baselines. You know, for those individuals that right now are saying, well, I hear what you're saying, Dr. McCready. I, I appreciate that there are some tools out there to help me to do that. But how do I actually do it? Like, how do I actually change a thought that I've thought for many years or a feeling that comes up every time I see this person or experience this trigger? How do I actually change that? The, the really hopeful news here is that it can be done. And step one, and sometimes the hardest step, especially I think more for the male types than the females, uh, in general, it's a generalization, of course, there are cases where it's not the case, but is to recognize and admit what's really going on, how we really feel about someone or something or some issue. You know, and to start to see what our patterns really are. You know, kind of get past the denial. Um, kind of the male brain is, we're well known for our, um, not only resistance, but resignation and the denial and no, I'm, I feel great, you know, yeah. meanwhile, we're about ready to explode um, under there. So that's a lot of the battle. And then um, step two, kind of uh, once we recognize it, is um, take a, a genuine uh, approach to saying, oh, I can't, and understanding we really can start changing these things. 
So there's a, really a kind of a two-step process that I would in general talk about. One is to do regular practices where, and, and I, I personally try and start the day every day this way. Uh, if I do it's what's called a heart lock-in in the morning. You know, so I'm not reacting to anything. It's just me, you know, and uh, I'll still use some of the technology which measures your heart rate, your heart rhythms, your heart rate variability to keep myself honest. Now uh, where we use a technique shifting into a, a coherent state, you know, and do that for a few minutes. So I'm now I'm regularly hitting my brain with the coherent rhythm that it nat that we're born with, right? It's our natural resonant frequency. The body wants to be in the coherence. Right, and we naturally associate that in a healthy brain with everything's good, right? The physiology is stable. Um, so a lot of times to change, you know, a kind of a, you know, a lot of a mental emotional turmoil is really we have to shift the physiology first. We shift the physiology into a calm and naturally resonant or coherent state, then that helps calm the brain down. It's grandma's wisdom. <laughs> right? I mean, it really is, right? Uh, little kids, and just give you an example, and the. Uh, if a kid runs, falls down, they're crying. Grandma what, picks them up and you know makes sure his blood's not squirting out. And they're not really hurt, of course. What's the first thing she usually says? Breathe, honey. Yeah. Because we just know that taking a few deep breaths helps calm the nervous system, the physiology, which then takes the amplitude out of the over significance a lot of times of the emotion, you know. And we really can't hear anything, right, um, until we calm the physiology down. So anyway, a little sidetrack again there, but um, so but basically doing the heart lock ins regularly, um, and that really sets what we call a carryover effect. We get the physiology calmed down; it, it carries over into the day. You know, so set the intention. Um, you know, stuff's going to come up, but it's how do we deal with it, and then that's where the whole heart math tool set then comes in, which I know you're very familiar with. There's probably about eight primary tools and techniques that we can use. And really, heart math is really about navigating the day with more flow. It doesn't mean that challenges aren't going to come up. Of course they are. But it's really how we respond to and deal with those challenges that really determines how resilient we are and how, how we are using our energy throughout the day. You know, are we going to be burned out and exhausted at the end of the day or have some energy left to do the things we like to do, to interact with our family, do fun things? Uh, or not, because it's really this really gets down to energy management, ultimately. So uh, things that trigger, you know, based a lot of times on those unconscious patterns, maybe impatience. You know, and I, I can really I can pick for an hour, pick on impatience for an hour because it's well, it's just human. We're all just impatient, right? Um, well, yeah, but no. If, if people really understood how much energy we waste. And the biochemistry that we're creating that increases the aging process and really limits our, our cognitive capacities just through these sort of simple things like impatience. We would take a very different approach. So um, I know this is a long-winded answer to your question, but maybe pick one like impatience or frustration and say, okay, I'm going to deal with that one. I'm going to create my own inner observer when I start to feel that impatience or that frustration or that anxiety, whatever you start with. That's when you use a technique. As soon as you start yeah. the feeling, you make the shift, shift the physiology into coherence, right? And then. Uh, and what happens when we do that? So we notice that we're activating some old pattern that doesn't serve us anymore, whether it's impatience or I get worried or I'm angry or we're frustrated or whatever that is. Then I kind of break that by noticing it. And then you're saying kind of take a breath. Of course, we could also do this in the morning to set the tone for the day, but take some heart-focused breaths. Mm -hmm. Heart-focused breathing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then turn it while it's, yeah, so I'm saying it's both. We, we prep in the morning, or maybe a few times throughout the day to really start training the physiology in a very conscious way into coherence as our new familiar. Then that step two is be in the moment self-regulation of our, emotional diet you can say it that way um so let's say that um uh, just to stick with impatience but it could be frustration anxiety overwhelm whatever the that is that's our big energy drain so there uh, another analogy i like to use is you know you, you're the trains leaving the track emotions are kind of like that it gets triggered 
you know, and there it's starting to pick up the the feeling, the impatience in this case, is like starting to pick up momentum going down the track. And once it gets past a certain point, I mean, and I think people, if they're halfway conscious a lot of times, self-aware, can, can actually go, God, I'm getting frustrated. But they go with it anyway. It's too far down the track to stop it. Bow, out it comes and we say the thing we probably didn't really mean or... You know, or that we get grumpy because we're impatient and, you know, fuss at our kids or our coworkers or, or whatever that context is. So the, the thing, the practice is turning that energy around. Turn the train around. You actually literally <laughs> can with some practice. And you're kind of building that self-regulation muscle, if you will. There's the trigger. There it goes. No. In a meaningful way, I'm going to shift that energy and this is not about suppressing that never works it's about taking that energy and turning that into an using that same emotional energy and shifting it into another frequency like and it, when we do that what happens over time dr mccrady like let's say someone you know prepares for the day they do their heart lock in they set the intention to carry that throughout their interactions and and so on throughout the day and then they catch themselves right here i was impatient again right the train is starting to to go in that downward direction and into that depleting direction and then you know they 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 change the the direction of the train in the other direction they focus on something to appreciate they of course do heart focused breathing what will happen if they do that enough times so we do that enough times, often enough, with enough meaningfulness, you know, like not just swipe at, you know, uh, turning that around. That is exactly how you establish a new baseline. So then that's when this becomes, you know, we, when you, one of the ways you know you've established a new baseline is you don't have to work so much at it anymore. Mm-hmm. It's becoming more automatic, that whole process we just described. Right, it's because because that's become our new familiar baseline, and that's what's becoming f- the familiar, and that way the old patterns start to feel unfamiliar and uncomfortable. Well, this brings such a sense of hope to people that are like, I've always been this way, and I, and it's just not serving them anymore. That they can do things, pretty simple things, but they need to be done consistently, uh, and with emotion, with positive emotion, with a positive intent to to shift those behaviors. And what's going to happen like around them? Because I know you talked about us kind of being connected, if you will, through this this field, this magnetic field. So what what will happen when we shift some of our familiar old baselines? Well, there's 400 plus studies now that um, talk about the benefits of, of this kind of work of emotional self-regulation and shifting our baseline. I mean, I think for the at the individual level, um, the simplest way, and we've actually done surveys across people that have used this, and it all it really boils down to people feel better, and they do better. Whatever that is, you know, whether it's golf scores or um, mm-hmm. academic performance on the do better side, or you know, we've done a lot of work in you know law enforcement. Um, in that context, we're able to maintain our composure in the middle of a chaotic external world that might be going, whatever that situation would be going on, if it's more military, first responder type work. Um, If you're more in the office, it's you're really able to communicate with more clarity, not uh, let yourself get triggered because somebody in a meeting, you know, said X or uh, X email, you know, so we're able to stay composed and and really um, access our higher cognitive abilities to, make decisions. I mean, decision, moment to moment decision making is one of the biggest benefits. I think we start making better choices, um, not just for ourselves, obviously for ourselves, but for uh, the others that we might be in charge of or if we're in a leadership role. Um, start accessing, I think, one of the big benefits where we didn't get to, we may not have time today, but uh, is really what we call the heart's intuitive guidance, you know, that deeper uh, intuition that uh, is just really kind of coming from another energetic uh, place, if you will, uh, be, being able to see more objectively and clearly what, what really the best choices, um, not just for our personal uh, benefits, yes, that too, of course, but also yeah. for, could be our business, our company, our family. Um, yeah. And it's really kind of cool to hear that perspective as well, because sometimes people are not necessarily willing to adapt their own behavior. uh, But if they know that it's negatively impacting the people they care about, 
like for example, their children and others, they might be more willing, right, to kind of pursue that, to take the effort. And then of course, they're the ones that benefit first and foremost, and then everybody else does as well. Um, and how does that connect? I know we only have a few minutes here, but how does all of this personal work that we do, how does that impact like our world at large? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a whole other hour. But let me give you the, <laughs> let me give you the, the the short cliff notes to that one. Is we already talked about how the harsh radiating the field and our emotions uh, are affecting the information in our fields, and that other people are sensitive to and, and have measurable changes. So if we're able to maintain our own emotional com composure and coherence, that we're radiating that into our personal field environment, and that is directly and measurably affecting those around us. In, uh, in in really important ways, um, oftentimes, that can help uplift a, a team, right? A team meeting, or uh, if leaders really can bring this in organizationally. It's really the only way to start shifting organizational baselines. By the way, but I think where you're really asking me, this is another kind of project here at the HeartMath Institute, to be called a Global Coherence Initiative, where we're taking this from the social to the global level. And I know you tried to ask me this earlier, but the, we, we all live within the magnetic fields of the Earth, right? So the, the Earth, you know, the, what I'm talking about now is the geomagnetic field, the North-South Pole, you know, the, what our compasses tune into. So that's a, a huge field that radiates many thousands of miles out into space around the Earth. And thank God we have it, because it's the shield that shields the Earth from the solar wind and these things. So without the magnetic field, Earth would not be Earth, right? It would look like Mars very quickly. So there would be no atmosphere, no water, but all be quickly blown away by by these things. So um, the to really do this justice, we maybe do another interview someday if you want. But the one of the things that uh, about magnetic fields that I actually didn't learn until much later, even as a communication engineer, I didn't know this until later in, in our work here, that you can magnetic fields, you can actually pluck the field lines and they vibrate like guitar strings. So the magnetic field of Earth, is, is the solar wind is rushing by and the Earth is turning and it's plucking the strings, if you will. The magnetic field lines are vibrating and the, they're very large. So just like a guitar or any stringed instrument, of course, the length of the string and the tension determines its frequency that it vibrates at, or the note, the pitch, whatever you want to call it. So <laughs> Earth is exactly the same way. And we are living within a rhythm, which was what is really, just probably shouldn't be surprising, but it kind of is when you first learn it and see it in your own data, is the frequencies and vibrations of the vibrating fields of Earth are the same as our physiology. So in other words, the uh, they are t technically called field line resonances, that's the name for the magnetic field lines vibrating. One of the primary, when, we're in, when Earth is in a stable mode, you know, there's not big solar flares and stuff going on, just normal modes. The primary resonant frequency of Earth, the field line resonances, is a fre in frequency language 0.1 hertz. You asked me about that earlier, because that is exactly the same frequency as our heart rhythms when we're in a coherent state. And we're in a coherent state when we actually feel good, when we're actually feeling things like kindness and care and appreciation and gratitude and love and compassion. It's just kind of how we're wired to be. We are in resonance with the frequency of Earth. And a lot of current studies and over the last few years are showing it is a really good thing to be in sync with and resonant with the natural frequencies we live in of Earth. Um, there's a whole lot of benefits from that. It's actually an energy source for us. And um, when enough of us do that, when we're coherent, we're, we're resonating at that frequency, what might happen in our world for those hearing? Like, what's the bigger impact of their own inner personal work? Well, it's, uh, we're a lot more stable. It's, uh, think of this as a giant group battery. The, you know, when the fields are disturbed, like we've just gone through some recent solar flares. Uh, I'm not sure when this will air, but, but so people get to get edgier, right? And, the more glitches go on in, in our communications and so on. But part two, uh, and this is kind of where the, the kind of new leading edge scientist, sciences is headed that we're really looking into now, is not only are we affected by the fields, there's no question of that. Hundreds of papers are showing this now 
in a lot of different ways. But what I'm suggesting is we're also broadcasting because we have the same resonant frequencies, both as two different fields, the Earth's geomagnetic field and one called Schumann resonances, which overlap with our brain rhythms, that we are literally broadcasting and coupled and coupling information through resonant coupling into the larger field. So when a lot, enough people, uh, and this, um, I wish we had a little bit more time here, but uh, can't give examples, but uh, so what I'm saying is enough people really become more energetically responsible in a kind of a saying we say around here a lot in the Global um, Coherence Initiative is become aware, of, well, just ask yourself, what are you feeding the field? What are the, what is the vibrations, emotional vibrations? Because they, well, now we, we are already talking in vibrational language and frequencies that we can measure. Um, what, what are we feeding that field? Because I'm, what I'm saying here is what we feed the field matters. It has measurable impacts on others around us. And we're starting to see things now that indicate it's also a global thing as well. So as a long, when enough of us come into that more self-responsibility and we're feeding the field more love, more compassion, right, more care, more kindness, that matters. It puts a stronger signal into the larger field environment that all living beings, not just people, are, are, are in that helps lift um, the whole system. As you reflect back to all of your life's work to date, if you were to kind of sum it up into one insight, suggestion, uh, wisdom for the listeners, what, what would that be? What do people need to know? Um, follow your heart. But I, and I mean this not in a metaphor. I mean, that's, we didn't really get into this today, but it's really kind of what heart math is about. Because uh, what I am suggesting is that we, yes, we have a physical heart and it has a brain and it affects the brain in our head. All of that's absolutely true. But we also have what we call the energetic heart. And I'm s suggesting that that's real and it's real structure. And that that is really vibrating in another kind of dimension of our awareness. And that that's what we want to, when we really talk to our deeper self, that's the bridge of, of, to that other d domain of our earlier undivided wholeness. So this is um, not a metaphor. It's really how to get coherent, calm the mind and emotions. I mean, uh, so we can actually hear. It's not necessarily a still small voice, like is often said. Uh, it's a very, it's a very clear voice, the voice of the heart of our or of our larger self. You know, you can call it your higher self, your spirit, whatever you want to. We here at Heart Map, we just call it our larger self. But that's that's our own intelligence heart intelligence that unfolds who we really are. And that's, that's that that brings into to elevating our, our awareness and our consciousness. That is exactly how we do it. And um, so that would be my simple advice is learn to quiet the mind and emotions and really follow the, um, follow the heart. Um, a really very insightful hour kind of weaving in and out between science and kind of just simple, uh, you know, just, insights and ideas that just make sense that we all intuitively know and sometimes we forget how simple it really can be and and the science has proven that and so thank you uh, for taking the time to be here with us today and how can people learn more about the heart math institute your many uh, research studies and of course the other arm of heart math in terms of the technology and programs and so on yeah but you can kind of get access to all of it at heartmath.org uh, there is two heart maps, the .com and the .org. Uh, the .org is the research and, and education side. We have a lot of free resources on our website, and uh, we also sell the technology there as well. That helps support the research. Um, we don't sell a lot of stuff, but it's, it's, it helps fund the research and, and the educational efforts. Uh, so, um, well, thank you again for following your heart and pursuing this uh, pretty fascinating career for, uh, for the rest of us to believe in what's possible when we do follow our own hearts. Thank you. Most welcome.